right, so who visited the website? For the yeah. Amadis website Fulbright program? Good. Yeah. All right. Yes, you should. <laughs> All right, so everything is on our website. There are a lot of info in there, how to apply, what to bring to our office as part of a complete application dossier, uh, tutorial videos, frequently asked questions, and our contact info just in case you needed to get in touch with us. You can come to our office, you can attend one of our information sessions, which is this one. Um, and so to get know, uh, to know more about the program. The first thing that you should do is to click on that link that says apply now and go and start an application and apply for the program. Um, as Miriam and I explained earlier, the application is composed of 12 sections, um, two essays you have to submit, please spend time working on your essays, three recommendation letters. Recommendation letters, they must submit it, be submitted online. For us, it could be in French or in English, and they are confidential, so you're not allowed to read what's inside the letters. If the letters are in, in French, we will take care of translating them. Yes. In the recommendation letter? Yes, just the recommendation letters. If they're French, that's fine. We can take care of that because I know sometimes you'll find you have like a very good professor who you think like, oh, the recommendation letter from this person is going to help my application, but the person is not that great in English, so mm -hmm. French should be fine. No Arabic. So um, three recommendation letters must be submitted online. Online process is very easy easier than just give them a hard copy of the app the you know recommendation letter and ask them to just submit it so online application register them with their email address they instantly gonna receive an email from embark with a login info username and a password they're gonna log into you know the section where they have to write your recommendation letter type it and then submit it as Miriam and I said earlier, please ask them not to be you know very generic he's great he's awesome and she's nice we're pretty sure you are, but we want to know more, you know, about you, academically speaking and professionally speaking. Uh, recommendation letters, as we said. Um, translation, we do not ask for that now. Upload your transcripts the way they are. If they're French or in Arabic, go ahead and uh, scan and upload them. Um, resume, also, we ask for that. If you do have any certificates, you've done any online training or courses, or you did any kind of thing that you got a certificate from, we do not ask for those certificates. Just write every single thing in your resume or you know, in your um, CV. If we need a certificate for any of the things you listed there, we will ask you to bring them. But because of the limited you know, amount or space we have on the uh, Embark application for your application, uh, just do not um, upload them. So 12 sections, two essays, three recommendation letters, tr uh, your transcripts, uh, resume or CV, um, and a TOEFL score. If by the time you are going to submit your online application, you do not have the score, that's all right. Go ahead and submit your application. But once you bring the hard copy of your application, make sure to bring your score. Submitting the online application is not, it doesn't mean that, fine, I'm going to go ahead and review your application. You must submit supporting documents to our office, meaning that you really need to uh, bring a signature, uh, signature form which you, you will find, you know, go, as I said, visit our website, it will tell you exactly where to find it. Uh, certified true copies, they could be confirmed. Certified true copies of all your transcripts, starting from the back until the last thing that you got. Um, and then if you wanna bring a hard copy of your resume, if you wanna bring a copy of your application or not, I mean, it doesn't matter to me, as long as I have a confirmation that you submitted your form. And you're gonna get it the minute you're gonna click on submit, okay? Uh, two photos, if you have a, a passport, just bring a copy of that passport. I have all this list, so you don't have to write it down, it's on the website, okay? Bring all that and bring it to my office before May 30th. And please do not wait until May 30th to bring it. I'll have like every year, have this long line in front of my office with people submitting, and I know it takes time to compile everything and put it together, but just make sure not to, to come early. So this is the first phase of the application. Submit a complete application. You're gonna get a receipt that you submitted your application. Let's make sure. <laughs> and then you're gonna review it. A committee um, gonna sit down and just gonna review all the applications, call people for interviews. Interviews are scheduled for uh, the month of August. So we're gonna do interviews and then people who are gonna make it from the interviews are gonna be called nominees. We only have 12 nominees. We have 10 finalists and two on the waiting list. We work with all nominees, with all 12 nominees. We work to help them apply to four American universities from their choice. And when I say from their choice, it's your choice. 
meaning that Mariam and I are going to help you to do your research. You're going to come up with a list of, I would say, six schools, mm -hmm. and then, you, then I'm going to introduce you to the team in Washington, D.C., who's going to be helping you to work on the second part of your application. So the, we're, we're two teams, team here to recruit and nominate people, and then a second team in our office in Washington, D.C., to be able to work with the 12 nominees to apply to the different schools. So, um, all right, sending the applications, they will also ask you to send the list of schools, uh, do a research, we're gonna help you do research, send to school, and then you're gonna meet with them virtually to discuss your choices. You're gonna discuss your choices, agree on the four universities you're gonna apply to, and then by that time, you're gonna be choosing schools, but also you need to sit for the exams, the GRE, the GMAT, or the TOEFL I and the TOEFL IBT. This all can happen between August and I would say um, February or March, depending on how late the deadline is of your uh, university or school. Sometimes there are even schools who go up to you know April or May, but it depends. You work on the applications, you submit the applications, and then you wait, and then we'll see which school will accept you. Sometimes you got accepted by the four schools you applied to, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes one, and sometimes none. It happens. It's very rare, but it happens. So, who can tell me, if you got accepted to four schools, which school are you gonna go to? The first one. No, it's not the first one. Placement, final placement, goes back to State Department. But remember, you agreed to apply to those schools because you like applying to those schools. You like mm -hmm. the program, you like everything about it, you like the state. Uh, you agree that it's gonna be, it's gonna good, it's, it is a good fit for you to go and study there and get a degree from there. Final placement is up to state department, okay? Um, and then some of you might have, you know, if they get accepted, might have to do an English training before they start the program. Some of you, before starting the program, will need to do a pre-academic program that could be a month to just help prepare you for, you know, academic studies. Some of you will only have to attend an orientation, a three-day orientation, before you start your um, academic studies. Master's degree, if you're applying for a master's degree, it could be one year, a year and a half, or up to two years, but no more than two years. PhD is just 10 months of, uh, academic, of doctoral research. Uh, there is a possibility for you to do a practical training after you finish your master's degree. It's not guaranteed. You have to apply. There are specific requirements for that. And once you are there in the U.S., they would tell you exactly what are their eligibility requirements for that, when to apply, and if you, you know, you're going to get the training. The training is up to 12 months, uh, considering that over the two years, you might do like two to three months between the two years. So when they combine all of those things, um, it's up to 12 months of practical training. Uh, one more comment about that. Um, so for students, either being on an exchange program or on a regular student visa, the F1, uh, yes, you are eligible to work experience, but the only um, work experience that might um, in which you might be interested is the optional practical training, which is up to one year um, of internship related to the field of study uh, from which you got your degree and you don't go out there looking for internships you should go directly to the um, international student admissions or anyone in charge of international students in the department that accepted you and you ask for the deadlines and you ask for the procedures you don't have the right to apply for internships or any job opportunities on your own. It's, it's not legal. So not because you are told that you can work in the U.S. that you can actually do it with a student visa. Um, they will give you training about this. I think it's the orientations. Yeah. Um, they cover all of those details, but it's good for you to know even at, um, at this stage to know um, what are the opportunities that are offered to you and what are the what is the framework of each opportunity so you should just keep this in the back of your mind and I hope you will use this information at some point what I try to tell people is that think of the Fulbright program not just an, as an academic opportunity for you but also as a cultural exchange program because it has like, you know both components when you're there when you're on campus I know it's early to, 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 to you know talk about this but it's something also uh, we want your application to reflect. We want to see, oh, this person is going to be a very good representative of Tunisia on campus. And it could be one of 
the questions that we're gonna ask you during your interview. How do you think your campus is gonna benefit from you, your presence there? Yeah. How the student body you think gonna, you're gonna fit in and how are you gonna represent Tunisia there? You know, one also very important component that we look in an application for the any kind of scholarship program is that what is it that you're gonna do? What is it, what kind of expertise you think you're gonna bring back to Tunisia that would help, you know, a specific community in whatever region you are in? This is also something we look for. We invest in you, not just for you just to go and have, you know, a, a degree, uh, you know, expertise, but we also want to benefit from whatever thing you're gonna, you know, learn from there. Come here and share it with other people. And that's why there, there is the two-year home residency requirement, which applies to the Fulbright program as well. Yeah. Any more questions before we wrap it up? Yep. So are we allowed to know uh, the number of uh, applications each year? Like we receive? Yeah. Er, each year? Like we have hundreds and hundreds, I would say. It's under a thousand, but hundreds of applications we receive. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so um, when uh, can someone get here? can get his back uh, his TOEFL report from the M uh, M is, is it before the uh, is it before that I gave you the no you can paper? come to my office whenever you want whenever I want okay uh, and um, if uh, anyone uh, if uh, everything is completed and uh, the student is going to the USA is there like specific time uh, like for this application um, like which month in the you're which month you're gonna go to the, US? to the US you need to start fall 2018 so you're gonna go between any time between June and September depending on what exactly if you do have a pre-academic program and orientation or you don't have anything sometimes you don't have any of that so you end up going in August so it depends on when exactly your program starts because each program in each school they will have a, a different you know beginning yeah. or start date universities have different schedules according to what they have to offer um, but at least y there is there is an office that takes care of international students, and that should be your uh, your number one reference in case you have any questions. More questions? So uh, I want to talk about the uh, recommendation letter. Yes. So for the case of um, uh, for recommendation from my my work supervisor. Mm -hmm. So the problem here in Tunisia is that um, uh, he might think that uh, it's some kind of threat. I mean, you're going to leave the company, you're going to search for another opportunity. But uh, also for a uh, university, it is an advantage mm -hmm. for having a work, uh, work experience. So uh, my question is, can I ask uh, someone else uh, at the company, not my direct supervisor? Um, you, my well, so. the point is you should, it should be delivered from for someone who directly supervised your work, not necessarily your direct supervisors, because we don't just assume that all companies work in a vertical way and there is nothing happening on the sites. So if you know that there is one person who at some point supervised a project, you can ask that person to recommend you. He or she still can be eligible um, to recommend you. Just someone who just assessed your work at, at some point. And Something else that is very important, you don't need to ask your current employer. Uh, you can ask, for example, even I mean, a small s internship that you got during summer and when you were still a student. It still is work experience and it still is someone who, d who was at some point your direct supervisor. So you don't necessarily need to be, or sometimes we, the relationship between supervisors can be a challenge. And this is why we ask for I mean, a pretty solid work experience, not only for us to select you, but also for you to be given a choice. Just one last comment. Is there anyone here interested in the non-degree part of the... Yeah. Here? Yes. For, for you, it's... Uh, you are enrolled in a PhD here in Tunisia? No. No. So th first thing that you, you must do, you have to register for, uh, you know, get accepted here to start a PhD, and then you need to apply. The process is different because you don't have to fill out an application for the yeah. schools. You just need to get a professor to accept to work with you there. So the process for PhD, the non-degree is way easier than those applying for master's degree. All right. All right, so it's one last question. Yeah, one last question. One last question. Uh, for the recommendation letters, um, sometimes um, I, I ask my 
professor last year, and it turns out he's an assistant of a professor. So, are the recommendation letters should be written only by professors no. or only no, no. assistants? No, no. Here is the thing. The only condition is someone who supervised your work. Let me give you two scenarios here. You have one scenario of a professor, wow, person at your university who taught you in a classroom in an amphitheater of 250 people. And you have your prof de TD who taught you in a very smaller cell. Who knows you better? They both, super, they, they both graded your papers. So the person who can give, um, well, just take it like this. That's the only condition, someone who directly supervises your work. The other condition, what is on your mind? Someone who can write me a good recommendation. So the content of the recommendation can sometimes be much more important than the title or the name of the person who recommended you. So this is how you should think. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up. Thank, Thank you so you much for much. coming. Yeah.